He did tell me what I needed to be thinking. Got a couple of places in Scripture this morning I want you to join with me if you would. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Get my rally towel out there. And then you can go there or you can just let me tell you what it says. But over to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians 2 and verse 20. The past couple of weeks have just absolutely almost been a nightmare. I said on live stream that I was very upset with about 100 million people. That's a, that's a strong statement to make when it's just you. What are you upset at 100 million people for? Assuming you didn't watch the live stream or the broadcast on, on uh, Facebook or, or the recast on uh, YouTube or wherever else you would have found it, Vimeo. I was upset with 100 million people that didn't go and vote this year. I was upset that 100 million people, you're going to love some of these rem- these reasons. Well, God's in control and He didn't need me to vote. God is in control and gave you the right to vote, the privilege to vote. When you get to the place that you can't vote for the leadership, I don't want to prophesy this, but when you get to the place you can't vote for your leadership, and it's selected by whosoever is the meanest, the biggest, the strongest, has the most weaponry and so forth, you'll wish you had that opportunity to vote again. You don't know what that's like. You've not lived in that kind of environment. Is America perfect? No. Hasn't been perfect since we got off at Plymouth Rock. Let's be honest, Christopher Columbus didn't even find us. He found a group of islands off the East Coast. And since that time, I found out how horrible a mean a person he was. And folks, I'm telling you straight up, I'm not believing all the rewritten history. I'm going to say that again. I'm not believing all the rewritten history. Are there things that we can add to that history that we did know? Yes. But to do away with the previous history, that's like, that's about as stupid as tearing down statues. Glory. I'm going to be good. Don't worry. But I'm upset at 100 million people who said either my vote doesn't count, it doesn't matter what I say, God's whatever the goofy reasons. The only people that had really good reasons were those that died. And I understand they voted Democrat. Or those that were dealing with de- life and death situations in hospitals and, and, and intensive care units and emergency rooms. Those people had reasons just to sit at home and not vote Lord help us so I got troubled because the life I remember growing up as a kid is gone the life I knew growing up as a young adult is gone the life I knew as a middle aged adult ought to still be working but it's pretty much gone And I've said before and I say again, I'm concerned about the world we're leaving behind. I don't want to be like Hezekiah who said, well, at least there'll be peace in my time. What about your sons, your daughters? What about your grandchildren? What about your great-grandchildren? How about them? How about we do something that gives them something to look forward to? And yet, and yet, and yet I don't hear that much anymore. The scripture says in chapter 8 and verse 23 of the book of Matthew when Jesus got into a boat his disciples followed him and suddenly a great tempest or storm arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves but Jesus was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him saying Lord Save us! We are perishing. Jesus said to them, 
Why are you fearful? You of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. To Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Here it comes. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Say it again. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Father, in the name of Jesus, since Monday, God, I've been mulling this over in my spirit, in my mind, in my heart. Since Monday, God, Lord, I've been dealing with, with this scripture, with this message, God, Lord. And Father, I thank you, God, Lord, for what you've given because I believe you gave it to me to give it to the people. And now, God, I pray in the name of Jesus, help us to hear you. Help us to hear your word. Help us, Father God, Lord, to understand the life that we now live. In Christ's name, we all said amen and amen. All this past week, I've heard all kinds of follow-up comments regarding last week's presidential election. I mean, there have been some doozies. Those comments have ranged from people proclaiming the superiority of God to cause the election to be reversed, the, you know, results of the election. A lot of prophets have declared some things. I trust God. It's man I have a problem with. I trust the Lord explicitly. And the problem is there's too many people who speak in the name of the Lord who don't have the authority to speak in the name of the Lord. There are too many people who claim that they're all that in a bag of chips in the Lord and they don't even have the bag, much less the chips. Hallelujah. I've heard people not only proclaim that about the superiority of God and what he's going to do with this election, but then people who declared their faith was devastated. Their faith was invalid because of the initial news of the media's declaration. Can I go on record and tell you that CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, CBS, who did I leave out? Yeah, there's a reason I just left them out. you got to be a real Fox I mean, got to be a real news deal. Here's the thing. They all proclaimed Joe Biden is the winner. If he is, okay. It's not what I wanted, I confess. I, I voted. I voted not by party line. I voted according to what this book said. And I'm in total agreement with another brother in the Lord over in Charlotte, North Carolina, who preached last week. Plain and simple. I cannot vote for those who support that which God calls an abomination, what God calls sin. And I love the way Brother Loran shared that with us. He said, I went to the voting poll and I held my nose and I pulled the lever for a man who did not agree with that other stand. I'm so tired of voting. Are you ready for this? For the least of the sinful. I'm tired of being torn between two. I want God to do this if He will. And He may or may not. But I would love it if the person I pick is not somebody that's got a questionable lifestyle in days gone by. Not years gone by, days gone by. I want someone who doesn't tell me what I want to hear just to get my vote. I want somebody with a backbone of tungsten steel. I want somebody to stand up there and have godly, honest, righteously, holy convictions to lead this nation. Well, brother, no one. We can't have that in the White House. We sure need it. I said, we sure need it. But yeah, the media doesn't get to choose who that person is going to be, even though they've done a great job the last four years. Was it easy to take him on? Sure. 
Donald Trump did not make it a hard task to pick on him. Donald Trump did not live a life that was stellar by any means. Can I tell you, with, the, with I, what I believe to be the spirit of Esau, he stepped up and was willing to take on a certain clan of people who have been ruling way too stinking long in Washington, D.C. I believe it's time, if you're going to limit the president, let's start limiting Congress. Let's start limiting the House of Representatives. Shout with me anytime. We limit the governor. We limit the lieutenant governor. We limit the mayor. We limit the alderman and the city council. We limit them for a reason. You're not born to keep it. Boy, y'all didn't amen real loud. I guess y'all like what's going on. I don't. I don't because it's affecting the world that I'm going to leave behind one day to my children and to my grandchildren and hopefully one day my great-grandchildren. You need to understand God's superiority is never in question. Number one, He's God. He's God. And God has all power both throughout heaven and the earth to do what God wants to do. God speaks and stars begin to pop open. Do you know that they still tell me to this day that we are just now still learning of stars that are coming into existence all throughout the universe because they have not shown before? What is that, Brother Nolan? That's the echoing voice of God saying, let there be light. God's will is not questionable, nor is it in a position to never be fulfilled. Listen to what I just said. God's will is not questionable. You may not agree with it. You may think it needs to go a different way, but God's will is God's will, and it's not questionable, and it's never going to be in a position that God said it, and it's never going to happen. If God speaks it, it's coming to pass. If God promised it, it shall be fulfilled. Somebody say amen. God's will is God's will, and God's will shall be done. Some people act like God's will is up for the possibility of happening. The question is, are you and I willing to be a vessel in His will, or are we going to operate as an unyielded vessel opposing the will of God? Habakkuk, I'm going to use the Chaldeans to bring Israel into line. Oh Lord, they're worse than we are. Are you sure? God, why would you want to do that? Don't worry about the Chaldeans, I'll take care of them. See, we don't understand that God can even use the ungodly to bring about a godly situation. Israel, who knew the Word of God, knew the God of the Word, chose to do their own thing, and God had to take a people that were vile, that were vicious, that were violent, and bring them onto the scene to bring Israel back to a place to acknowledge God. And honey, let me tell you, you and I may be okay, but there's a problem with the rest of this world. There's a problem. You and I may be walking the line. You and I may be keeping it straight and, and true. But the rest of the world has got a problem. And God's not afraid to bring in somebody that's worse off than us to get our attention. And you want to know when the church really grows? Are you ready for this? The church really grows when it's in persecution. Not when it's in control of the House and the Senate. Or the White House. The church really grows when it's in persecution. So I guess in one way I'm getting ready to grow. Just saying. But the thing, the other thing, if we look at the opposite of the superiority of God, and that being that, that our faith is devastated, what kind of faith do we have that becomes invisible the minute trouble comes our way? Do y'all know what I'm talking about? A family member dies, and this person who proclaims to be a great child of God, oh, oh my life is at an end. What in the world is that all about? I understand grieving. That's not grieving. That don't even deserve an Oscar nomination. Shout with me anytime. When somebody gets sick, we act like that's not supposed to happen to us. Can somebody please show me in the Word of God where it guarantees we won't get sick? I haven't found that yet. I've been looking. 
I find myself going through the book of concordance quite often. You know the book of concordance, right? I've even got one. i got a book of concordance that's this thick. Some guy by the name of Strong. And when the book's that thick, you better be strong. It takes all you can do to pick it up. But it's got every word that is mentioned, every single word that's mentioned in the Bible, in the King James Version. It doesn't matter what the word is. If it's therein, Brother Don, I can look up all the thereins. If it's wherefore, I can look up all the wherefores. It gives me the names of the individual, every, every scripture that they are mentioned in. But can I tell you, I have never found in the book of concordance anywhere where it says, my righteous shall not be sick. But it does say, is there any sick among you? Let them call the elders together. Let them anoint them with oil. Let them pray over them the prayer of faith, and God will save the sick. Somebody say amen. i got to get back to the outline I'll mess up. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 8. The Bible says that Jesus got on a boat and the disciples followed him. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 8 of the book of Matthew, you're going to find one powerful read going on there. One miraculous healing after another. Right off the bat in the very first three verses there, Jesus heals a leper. Why? Because the leper said, if you're willing, you can do this. And Jesus said, I am willing. Somebody say amen. Oh, hallelujah to God. We're not talking about the heartbreak of psoriasis here. We're not talking about some kind of a simple rash that came up. We're talking about leprosy that goes in and not only eats away the digits on your hand and the toes on your feet, but it also begins to tear up the organs on the inside of your body. This man knew being a leper had a death sentence. He didn't know when. He just knew it was coming. And he went to Jesus and said to Jesus, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me. And Jesus said, I am willing. Oh, how I'm so glad to know that the word from Jesus is, I am willing. When I go to God and I speak to him in prayer, I'm so glad to know that God says, I am that I am for whatever you have need of. Somebody say amen. I'm excited. I'm preaching to people this morning. I've been preaching to green upholstery for too long. Jesus healed the centurion servant. Not by going to the centurion's house. The centurion stopped him and said, look, I know what it is to be a man under authority. I recognize you're a man under authority. All I have to do is speak a word. All I have to do is give an order. And they'll do what I tell them to do. Lord, I'm not worthy enough that you should come up under the roof of my house. But if you'll just speak the word. If you'll just say the healing word for my servant. I know my servant shall be healed on the spot. And Jesus said, wow. That's that's Paul Nolan's interpretation. I've not seen this kind of faith anywhere throughout Israel. He said, your servant is healed. Yeah, glory. Thank you, Lord. He didn't argue with him. How will I know, Lord? You, you know, we we got to have definitions. You know, Lord, you know, will, will the fever be broke? You know, will, will he have sweat, great drops of blood? Lord, will his hair turn gray? He took the word that Jesus gave him and went home and found it to be just like. In fact, as he began to backtrack it, he found out that at the very moment that Jesus spoke, at the very moment Jesus spoke the word, the servant was healed right then and there. He goes on. Matthew tells us. Some of y'all may have trouble with this. Jesus went to Peter's house. Walked in the door. Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. Jesus loves even mother's-in-law. Mackenzie said, thank God. Jesus didn't pray over her. Jesus didn't speak a word to her. Jesus just went over and touched her. My God, I'm about to explode up here. If I do, forgive me, just, you know, sweep me up and bring the next guy in. The Bible finally gets, in Matthew chapter 8, the Bible finally gets to the place 
where all he can say is he cast out demonic spirits, people that were possessed by the devil, and healed. Are you ready for this? Healed all who were brought to him. Now I'm going to blow your mind right here, right now. Did everybody get healed in Jesus' day? No. And there's scripture to prove that. They were outside the gate called Beautiful where a lame man was brought every day to beg for alms. He was there when Jesus was there. But Jesus didn't heal him. You know what I, I find interesting about that verse of scripture in the 8th chapter of Matthew is all who were brought to him. I wonder, do we really, really bring our sick to the Lord? We have a saying in America, would you pray for me? Come up and we'll lay hands on you and pray for you. We pray for a lot of stuff, but how many times do we bring that need to the Lord? I don't know about you, I couldn't mail it in like my ballot to get saved. I had to show up. He said, well, you mean you don't get saved church didn't say that? I said, I had to show up. I showed up on a bended knee with a, with a heart that was humbled to the Lord. And I'm here to tell you, when I did that, then God began to move. But honey, you can't, you can't mail it in. You, you can't text it in. You know, Lord, I want you to save me, I believe. That's, wouldn't that be great? And if that's the only way that you could communicate, marvelous. I know people that the only way that they could communicate was blinking their eyes once for yes and twice for no. Woo. Some people could just barely squeeze somebody's hand or, or move a finger to let you know that they heard what you had to say. And folks, be careful. If you ever get around somebody in a coma, you better be aware of the fact that they can hear what you're saying. Amen. So Jesus, after doing all of that, all those powerful healings, deliverances, all of that power stuff going on, Jesus gets into a boat. I don't read it. Matthew doesn't declare. He said, I'm going to go get in a boat. Jesus just walked. Got in the boat. I know I'm driving them crazy up there. And behind him, like little ducklings following a mama duck, here came 12 disciples right behind him. Jesus got into the boat. Didn't say he grabbed a hold of the, of the wheel, if there was a wheel on it. I don't think there was. Didn't grab a hold of the rudder and said, I am the captain. I'm your captain. I'm your captain. You remember that line? He didn't do that. He got on a boat. Twelve men followed him. At least three, maybe four of those men were experienced men in a boat. They knew how to hoist the sail if they wanted to use the wind. They knew how to use the long oars. To, this was not a small boat. Can I just go on record here? This boat was probably one of about 300 that at any given time would be found on the Sea of Galilee. You talk about crowded. You thought every day out there was Memorial Day weekend. Some of y'all will get that. This boat was big enough to easily hold Jesus and his disciples. There's a good possibility that boat belonged to one of them, to Peter or to Andrew or to Philip or somebody. It belonged to one of them. There's a possibility, great, great, great possibility that it belonged to one of them. But it was large enough to hold a sail that would go from about where that music stand is right there over to about where this speaker is right here. It was big enough for that to be brought down and folded and placed aside. It was big enough to have uh, oars that were probably uh, about 50% longer than the altar is right there. And this ain't no rowboat, honey, okay? Where you got both oars in your hand and you're, no, no, no. It would take a couple of you to get her going pretty good. If you didn't have enough on one side and you had overabundance on the other side and they were all doing their own rowing, you're going around in a circle after a while. This boat was huge. This boat absolutely is now packed with 12 men and the Lord Jesus Christ. And after seeing all of the great miracles and healings that they had just been witnesses to and been involved with, catch this, they're on board for more. Get it? 
on you Navy guys should have been shouting over that one. Hallelujah. I got three guys in the Navy up here, not one of them shouting. They were on board for what Jesus was going to do. They saw what he could do on the land. Let's see what he can do at sea. So they went cruising with Jesus. Let me just ask you a question. Why are you following the Lord? You don't have to answer out loud right now, but I want you to think about that for just a second or two. Why are you following? Why are you following the Lord? You that are watching by live stream this morning. Why are you following the Lord? Has, is it because you saw some mighty miracle? Is it because something powerful happened to you? Is it because your mama, your grandmama? Why are you following Jesus? And apparently they forgot who was on board that boat. Apparently it just went right over their head. When the disciples got on board the boat, there was no indication. There was no warning sign out there. They said, don't get in the boat today. There was no understanding that there was going to be trouble on the water. There was no barometer readings. There was nothing. They all just followed Jesus onto the boat. And once they got going, it was a beautiful day to sail. Now, the Sea of Galilee is not very big. It's only 13 miles long, 7 miles wide. At any place, its deepest depth is about 150 feet. There's over, over 680 feet of shoreline that they launched out from. In fact, if you were to do the mileage, it probably is more like about 680 miles all the way around. Maybe not. But the point is, this is an oversized lake, but yet it's referred to as a sea, and here's why. On that Sea of Galilee, because of the uniqueness of its location, it is surrounded by mountains all the way around. This Sea of Galilee sits at, catch this, this Sea of Galilee sits 680 feet below the sea level. In other words, Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Okay? Mediterranean? Galilean. Mediterranean. Got that? If somebody drills a hole on the Mediterranean seaside through the mountains, it's going to fill up. And all of a sudden... There'll be a bigger lake, a deeper lake. But otherwise, that's the way it is. And because of its unique location, they couldn't always see the storms that developed on the horizon. They could only see to the tops of the mountains around about the Sea of Galilee. And so normally you would find peaceful, tranquil waters. But when these storms would come in, can you see the lights in the center up here? Pretend you're on the surface of the Sea of Galilee when it's calm and peaceful. Now look up. The waves on the Sea of Galilee can get that tall. About 20 feet. Where you're at sea level, where you're sitting right now would be about how high you would be in that boat. But can you imagine a storm coming up and all of a sudden you've got waves as tall as the very center of this ceiling? Do you understand when the Bible said that this storm suddenly came up and began, the waves began to come into the boat? Now, I've been in rough waters on a cruise ship. I would lay down at night, and the ship would be doing this. Me, I'd be doing this. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. I mean, I would go to sleep. I slept because I would be in rocks like I was in the cradle again. Oh, hallelujah to God. But had I been outside, 
If I had been outside and had the wind blowing against me, if I had been outside and had the waves rush up the side of that ship and splash me, hmm, I'm convinced I'm not going to be a happy sailor. So I can imagine being in a boat that's probably as wide as from here to there. And waves, waves. I could just see them. Keep bailing. I mean, it went from calm, peaceful, tranquil, so much. So catch this. Jesus, I love Jesus, curled up at the back of the boat and went to sleep. Took a nap. Mm. I like naps. I didn't like them when I was Mason's age. When I was Mason's age and they said, it's time to take a nap. No, I don't want to. No, it's time for all good little boys. I'm not a good little boy. Therefore, I can't take a nap. But I took a nap. And now... I'm a real good boy, and I love naps, and I hope to sneak one in this afternoon. Sister Nolan won't have to threaten me. She won't have to pull out a switch or a belt or whatever. No, no, no. She'd say, honey, go in there and lay down. I'm like, okay, if you really want me to. So Jesus curls up in the back of the boat, goes to sleep, goes to sleep when the storm hits, stays stays asleep. He's not inside of a cabin. He doesn't have a covering over him. He's back in the back. <laughs> Do you really think he snored, Brother Nolan? Why not? He was just like us, subject to the same things that we're subject to. And lo and behold, He's sleeping away. They're screaming and hollering, fearful that they're about to die. They're screaming like little girls who've just been surprised by a spider in the corner up above them. And finally, these grown men who were experienced fishermen on these very waters are now standing there and they're shaking Jesus awake and telling him, shouting at him, Save us! Oh, we're going to die if you don't. Listen, they didn't sign on for this kind of experience. Oh, I'm all about miracles and power and healings and deliverances and, 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 and exercise and spirits. I don't know about this, this here 20 foot away. Don't look at me like that. You're fine and dandy as long as we stay right here in the center of Hamlin County or Hawkins County, as the case may be, or, or, or where did Joe go? Claiborne? To Claiborne? Is that right? Claiborne County? I can pick any other county. Jefferson County if you want me to. Whatever county you want. But the fact of the matter is, folks, sometimes even in our tranquil little world, all hell breaks loose and somebody got around somebody with a virus and it affects everybody else even though none of us got affected. And out of a sense of caution, we did what we could do, did what we were supposed to do. Well, mostly. I won't tell if you won't. But the fact of the matter is, is that in this world we live in, I just got informed the other day of a friend of mine who died of COVID. I didn't even know he'd been sick, but he died. Nobody bothered to tell me that he had passed away. I've got friends of mine who've had it and other acquaintances who have had it. Some of them have been sick to the point of death. Others barely had a sniffle. Some got tested, tested positive, and never showed any signs of anything. God help us. I didn't sign on for that. I don't mind an illness that I can see. I don't mind an illness that I can be sure of, but I can't get the CDC, Dr. Fauci, or anybody else with any supposed lick of I love what you said about, about those scholars this morning, Brother Don. I agree with you 100%. i never seen so many people read this text and come up with about 100 million different ways to affect us with it. But I'm amazed that we still don't know what to do. We still are, there's not, last count, I, I got tired of looking with 19 different things to indicate you've got the virus. 19. 19. We can do 20. No, no, no. 19. 
And friend, if just one of those says you've got it, you're in trouble. Well, I've been living with half of those symptoms for the last 15 years of my life. If your body aches, seriously? Seriously? When doesn't my body ache? I lay down, I hurt. I try to sleep, I hurt. I wake up, I hurt. I walk, I hurt. I go to the bathroom, I hurt. Everything I do, I drive, I walk, I pick up boxes, says Sister Nolan's requesting commands, and I'm still hurting. So I've had COVID-19 for 15 years, apparently. These guys did not sign on for getting in a boat to be overwhelmed by storms with 20-foot high waves. They're all in for, hey, let's do the miracle of fish and bread again. Hey, hey, let's cast that devil out in your name, Lord. Hey, hey, let's give some blind guy his sight back, some deaf guy his hearing back, some dumb guy the ability to talk and drive his wife nuts. Let's do something spectacular like that, Lord. Let's bring the dead back to life. But God, I don't want to be one of those that has to be brought back to life. I'd like to live. I didn't sign on for this kind of lifestyle. So what did you sign up for? Did you sign up for the kind of life, you know, the life of rainbows and butterfly kisses and birds singing sweet songs and melodies and such? Did you sign on for the life of flexed muscles, hair blowing in the breeze, amen, taking down tall devils in a single bound? People admiring who you are. Oh, I want to be just like pastor so-and-so, evangelist so-and-so. I watch these guys now. They're more about wanting to show their muscles off to you. I'm more about covering mine up. Go up there with shirts that appear to be two sizes too small. You know, make their pecs bounce. Like Dwayne Johnson. Don't look at me like that. I'm telling you the God's honest truth. It's not, it's not about Jesus in them. It's what they've got Jesus covered over with. I stand amazed at the number of people. Look, I, I'm not opposed to you having a buff body, girls. Some of y'all got that. But I am here to tell you, if that's the only thing that matters to you, is how good you look on the stage in regards to how you flex yourself for Jesus, you don't understand anything about Jesus. It's not about me. Less of me, more of Him. Less of me, more of Him. Less of me, lesser of me, lesser of me, more of Him. The life, maybe you signed up, is where everything goes right. There are no problems. All mountaintop experiences have an escalator to get you from there to there. I don't mind climbing as long as the stairs move. Can I get a witness? You know, you really ought to take the stairs for your health. If I'm going to live to get to the top of this building, I need the escalator or the elevator. Somebody shout amen. Paul said in Galatians 2 and 20, The life I now live in the flesh. The life I now live in the flesh. Oh, to hear some people talk. To hear some... Look, I put on the whole armor of God for a reason. Why? I'm living this thing in flesh. I need all the spiritual armor I can get. I'm living this thing in flesh. I don't get up and, you know, I, I think I told somebody about this the other day. I went to one of the restaurants after a Sunday morning service. A, a sweet little lady running about 80 years old. She looked at me. She said, you're a pastor, aren't you? I said, well, yes, ma'am, I am. I said, and I said, was it the hair? Was it the fact that I'm wearing a suit? She said, catch this. No, there's a glow about you. And I went, whoa. I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't have a clue as to what to say. I said, really? She, she looked at me. She goes, yes, really. She said, my husband, who's with the Lord now, he had the same glow after he had preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. I about had me a Holy Ghost hold down right there in the vestibule area of the Longhorn. Hallelujah. I, I had to control myself. But I was amazed. This woman 
saw something I didn't even know was visible. I've seen those pictures where they do Jesus and, and the disciples. They show them with a halo. Somebody says, that's their aura. How about that's the anointing? Blew me away. The life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. I want you to catch something here. It's not that I have lived. It's not that I'm going to live. It's that right here, right now, I'm living the life that is the life in the flesh under the glory of God by faith in Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how great I'm going to be tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. I might be able to point back to some things back in the day when God moved in certain ways in my life. But honey, let me tell you, I want you to know that what I've got right here, right now, is an up-to-date experience that is lived day by day by day by day by day. Because, friend, I'm living it in the flesh every day. Day that I live. Glory. Too many people try to relive the glory days instead of the gory days. Too many people try to live in the future talking about those things that are as though they already were. Well, honey, I'm doing good to deal with Sunday, much less what I'm going to do tomorrow. I've got some things on the schedule. I've got some things on the to-do list tomorrow. Some of them are church-related. Some of them are Sister Nolan-related. Some of them are, oh, my God-related. But I promise you, every day that I live, I'm going to live it in the flesh until He comes and changes me from mortal to immortal, from corruptible to incorruptible. I'm going to live it in the flesh with the power of God working through me through faith in God and by the power of the Holy Spirit to give me what I need to get through. I'm, I'm circling in. I'm coming in. Hebrews 11 1 says this. Now faith is... The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I loved R.W. Shambach. Anybody remember Shambach? Any of y'all listen to Shambach? The four of you? Y'all don't get out much, do you? R.W. Shambach was an outstanding preacher. You don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. And then the crowd, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Now he would pray a prayer of faith over you. Then he'd tell you where he was going to be. I want you to come and visit with him. He'd tell you how you could get a tape of that day's broadcast. And I would listen to R.W. and just, just drool in the spirit. But I love what he said one time. I'll never forget it. Now faith. Not yesterday faith. Not tomorrow faith. Not next year faith. Not faith in the life that's yet to come. But right now, faith. Is the substance of things hoped for. They say, well, I don't, I, 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 I know you're excited, preacher. Doesn't do a thing. Well, let me bring it down to it. It's just like the house that we just bought. Right now, I own about 20% of it. Right now, 20% of the house is my, the other 80% plus interest belongs to the bank, to the credit union. Here's the deal. Each month that I make a payment on that house, and if I give a little extra towards it, towards the principal, I'm getting more ownership of the house. I'm hoping in the next year or two, I'll own 25% of it. Maybe a bedroom and a half bath and the kitchen. And as I keep paying on it and pay a little extra on the principal, the, the, the original amount that I owed, I bring that amount down, but I also bring down the amount of interest I'm going to have to pay. Gra grab a hold of this. So that in a few years, when I look back, I'm not just a 20% owner anymore. I'm hoping in the next five or six years, I'm going to be 50% owner. Then I'm going to have something to say. 
I'd be like, honey, what do you want to do with it? You, you understand what I'm saying? Too many of us aren't even willing to invest in today. We're not willing to invest in today. You don't have a clue in the world what's going to happen today. Oh, you got an idea of what you plan on it. Like me, some of y'all are going to be going, you know. Some of y'all are trying to decide whether you're not going to go to the house and fry up some bologna or whether you're going to go to the restaurant and let them fry it for you instead. But the fact of the matter is, is that we got to live today, today. I can't live today, yesterday. And I can't live today regarding tomorrow. I may lay a foundation. I may put another coat on. But honey, the fact of the matter is, I got to live today, today. So the life that I now live in the flesh, I do so by faith in the Son of God. Somebody say amen. And one day, one day, when the trumpet sounds and the archangel shouts, Christ calls me up higher. Oh, hallelujah to God. I'm telling you, friend, things are going to change. Things are going to change. Things are going to change. All the aches and pains stay back. Amen. No more worries about not having anything but pain in my feet. Somebody said neuropathy, it takes away the feeling. It ain't taking nothing. It's giving me feeling. It's giving me feeling like I've never had before. And I tell you, if I did what I just did here a minute ago with that stutter step, without the anointing of God, I would be in a lot of pain. But oh, thank God, I feel something happening. I've been asking God, God, touch my feet again. God, touch the lower parts of my legs again. God, cause the feeling to come back. God, cause the ability to use them again. Oh, God, help me in the name of Jesus. Glory. I'm closing. I got to be faithful now if I'm going to have a right in days ahead to look back and go, wow, look what the Lord has done. Paul makes it pretty clear that the life I now live in Jesus Christ must be lived by faith. You ever go to work thinking your day was planned out? You got there and all of a sudden things changed? Maybe the people on the shift before you did not do something right and now you're stuck to have to fix their mistakes? You ever work production? That is the constant battle. You go in ready to do your day's worth of work and you got to wind up doing the previous guy's work that he refused to do while he sipped coffee and cut jokes with the boss man. Hardest shift to work, second shift. Easiest shift is the third shift. Laziest shift is first shift. Quote me. After Jesus was awakened, he, the Bible said, rose up. Most of us, when we wake up, we, wanna, we don't want to rise up. We want to lay there. We sing a song that talks about I just want to lay here right at your feet. I've been trying to get folks to change that from lay here to stay here. I don't want to be like a lap dog at the feet of Jesus. I want to be a child of God gathered at the feet of Jesus. Paul says, or, or Matthew says rather, that Jesus, when he was awakened, got up, rebuked first the wind and then the seas. Now, whether there was a particular order for a reason, I don't know, but that's how he did it. And when he rebuked the wind and the seas, everything went from there to there. Catch this. Jesus' words to his disciples are very clear. If you didn't hear it before, let me read it to you again. Why are you fearful? Oh, you have a little faith. And man, we've preached that. I've preached that. Heard it preached time and again about people with such little amounts of faith. The Spirit of the Lord checked me. Can I read it for you in possibly what may be the way Jesus actually said it? See, the Greek language is very descriptive. Very, very, 
very overwhelmingly descriptive. And you know how us English-speaking folks are. Nobody has the understanding like we have the understanding. What if Jesus, instead of saying, why are you fearful, O you of little faith? What if Jesus was asking them, why are you so afraid? You had the necessary faith in you to deal with this. Now, Brother Nolan, that's a stretch, is it? The Bible tells me in Romans 12 and 3, Paul said, I, through the grace given to me, to every one of you who is among you, I say to you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly. Why? Because God has dealt to each one of us a measure or the measure of faith. Are you ready? God has given you the faith that you need to deal with calm seas or 20-foot swells. God has given you the faith necessary to handle a life that has no aches and pains and other problems or going through hell because you've been diagnosed with cancer and you've got to have chemotherapy or radiation or surgery. Do you hear what I'm saying? God has given you the faith you need to live your life in the flesh by faith in God. God, I sounded like R.W. there for a minute. You see, our problem is we Americans have made little faith inconsequential. Jesus said, if you've got faith like a mustard seed, she cut on my hot you can say to this mountain, get up and get over here, and that mountain will move. Our problem is, is that we see small, we don't see power. I wish I was preaching to a Pentecostal church. I'm telling you, it blows my mind that we think we got to have some super wo duper whooper whopper kind of, you know, truckload of faith to do it. Friend, God gave you the measure that you need for your life to live this life by faith in the Son of God. Somebody say amen. You've got the faith. You got the faith to make you spiritually perfect. You've got the faith to absolutely help you through the good days and the all hell breaks loose days. Trust me, if you haven't had one, hang on. You've got the necessary amount of faith to deal with whatever storm suddenly shows up. A faith. This is, hey, Jesus is on board. I got it made. Jesus is on board. I'm living by faith in my Jesus above. I'm trusting and confiding in his great love. arms I'm living by faith I said I'm living by faith I want to know is anybody here living by faith and I feel no alarm somebody say amen Lord in the name of Jesus Christ help us this has been a year of storms. This has been a year, God, of storminess. We've had all manner of storms. And because somebody's presidential nominee did not get elected, their faith is devastated. Well, God, my faith is intact. You gave it to me. 
I have fostered it from time to time. I have absolutely fed it in ways, oh God, through the word of the Lord so that I would grow and my faith would grow. And in the name of Jesus Christ, if they were to dig up George Washington and you put life back in his body and he didn't win the election, I'm still going to be all right because you're still God and Jesus is still King of kings and Lord of lords and the Holy Spirit has adopted me into the family. Lord, in the name of Jesus, help me not to worry about where I follow you. Just help me to be concerned enough to keep following you in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the holy name of Jesus glory and from all harm safe in his sheltering arms I'm living by I said, I'm living by faith. Is anybody here living by faith? Well, then you can't feel no alarm. I have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the flesh by the Son of God faith in the Son of God faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me would you write where you're at just ask the Lord, Lord, if I haven't lived by faith in your son, forgive me. Lord, if I haven't realized that the life I'm living is not to be lived out into some pseudo-spiritual manner of way, but rather that I live it in the flesh. But I do so by faith in the Son of God. God, forgive me where I have failed you. Forgive me for screaming out in fear. Forgive me, oh God, for losing faith and thinking I'm going to die. God, if you make Donald Trump the president again, I'll put up with his braggadocious ways. But I'll pray for him. And God, if you let Mr. Biden become the president... And allow that kind of power to come to this nation. You've got a reason. And I'm going to pray real hard for them. But I'm going to continue to live for you. So Lord, here am I. Just a glob of flesh that can't do everything right. Can't say everything right. I just mess up. My flesh just messes up. But God, if you'll have me, I'm yours. If you'll have me, I'll live for you and I'll do for you and I'll speak for you. If you'll have me, oh God, I gloriously want you. And I pray, here am I. Use me. Send me. Here am I. I am yours, oh God. Right where you're at. Would you just lift your hands up and just pray? Pray something along that line. God, here am I. Use me. Here am I, God. Send me. Here am I, God. Put in my mouth the words I need to speak to my family, to my friends, to the people of God, Lord, who absolutely have turned their back upon you. Help me to turn my face towards you, oh God. And help me in the name of Jesus Christ to live in the flesh the life I now live by faith in your son you've got a need I don't want you to leave his house without us praying for you 
You've got something you need prayer for, something in your family, your friend, your job, your school, as the case may be. Don't you leave here until we prayed for it, prayed over it, and believed God to take care of it. Otherwise, service is tonight at 6. Oh, it feels good to say that again. Service is tonight at 6. I double dog dare you to come back. There, now you've done it. Let's have church tonight as well. Shake your hand if you can. If you can't, arm bump, elbow, fist pump, whatever. Give them a head nod in the name of Jesus. God bless you, each and every one we pray.